Hey, everybody. Welcome to the last session. No, actually not. Penultimate session, right? Uh, uh, it depends on how you count your sessions, right, Andy? Um, of what I think has been a terrific conference. Um, today, on this breakout session, we're going to discuss AI, democracy, and elections. Uh, my name is Michael McFall. I am the uh, director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies in Sina, the Encina building over there. Um, I'm also a professor of political science and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Um, at uh, FSI, we just created a brand new center of which all three of my colleagues here are at least partly in and partly other places uh, that called the St Stanford Cyber Policy Center. Um, Nate is the co-director, and well, well, I'll introduce everybody uh, quickly uh, in a second. Um, one of the things we just published um, was, it's called Securing American Elections, Prescriptions for Enhancing the Integrity and Independence of the 2020 U.S. Presidential Election and Beyond. Here it is. Uh, if you're old school and you still like printed things, we have some copies over there. <coughs> But of course, it's easily uh, found if you just Google FSI and you can download it there. I think some of us may talk about this, but, but some of us may not. We're going to talk about whatever we want to talk about, in fact, because uh, we're a free institution. It gets to do whatever we want. Um, uh, we have a great panel today with lots of expertise on this topic and more. Um, first, we're going to hear from uh, Nate Persley, Professor Persley, who's a well, the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. He also has affiliations with my department, Political Science and Communications. And as I just said, he's the new co-director of our, our new center at FSI. Uh, Nate works on so many things, I'm not going to read them all. <laughs> it's quite impressive. Um, from uh, elect, uh, redistricting, uh, you, you're basically involved in every aspect of our 2020 elections, right, Nate? Um, and so maybe... Yes, He's right. not running. Yeah, maybe next next cycle he'll be a candidate. Um, but he's done all kinds of things on all different parts of it. And maybe he'll speak to your whole <coughs> portfolio, or maybe he'll just focus on one piece of it. I'll let you decide. Uh, next, we'll hear from Rene Duresta, who is a the research manager for the Stanford Internet Observatory, which is uh, one of the central programs in the new uh, Stanford Policy Center. Um, where she investigates the spread of malign narratives on social networks and assists policymakers in understanding and responding to the problem. Uh, her most recent work uh, was with the select. Can I say this actually? Should I be yeah. clear? This is. Which one's that? Public. Nope, that's not out. Nope, that one's not out. Okay, no, no, <laughs> not I'm, 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 <laughs> she's, Oh, wait, that one. This, this one. It, one. She has advised <laughs> many pieces of the government and many uh, actors in this space, and I'm, I'm a little. Uh, Something's coming out soon, which we're not going to talk about. Uh, but this one is from the Select Committee on Intelligence, the U.S. Senate Committee. Uh, this report on Russian active measures, campaigns, and interference. And Renee, well, I'll let her explain what she did. She was uh, intimately involved in this report, another report, and m maybe future ones that I don't know about. We're, <laughs> we're really thrilled that she has joined us recently here at Stanford. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Andy Grotto, who is the director of the Cyber Policy Center uh, that's all, I already said all that stuff. The Program on Geopolitics, Technology, and Governance um, at uh, our new uh, uh, Cyber Policy Center. He's also a research uh, fellow at the Hoover Institution. And his research is at the intersection of national security and international economic institutions. Uh, before coming here, uh, Andy served at the White House. Uh, NSC's getting a lot of attention these days, including in um, testimony today from uh, 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 an NSC official, uh, where, but he, there he was um, the head of, well, I'm, I'm lost it in my notes here, um, Senior Director for Cybersecurity Policy, the, the official title, and had many other jobs before he joined the White House to do that. Uh, and we're also thrilled he's here. And Andy, make sure, why don't you advertise it right now? At three o'clock, he will be chairing another session on China. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and so we're going to end a bit early here. We're going to end around 2.30 or, th uh, um, yeah, 2.30, 2.45, so that Andy can get to his next session. And uh, we'll give you instructions as how to follow him there if you're interested in China. I got the you can just, you know, we'll just type. Okay, all right. So, Nate, take it away. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about the impact of digital technologies writ large on 
uh, democracy. Uh, Renee, I think, is going to talk specifically or more specifically about AI and and some of the areas that she works in. And I think Andy's going to talk uh, more e more deeply still on questions like deep fakes and the like. Um, so as as Mike mentioned, I do a lot of work in different areas of uh, sort of election regulation uh, and social media. I'm a law professor, a political scientist, and a practitioner in this area. Uh, I often say you can tell when I'm a law professor because I have opinions without data. You can tell when I'm a political scientist because I have data without opinions. And you can tell when I'm being a lawyer because, well, it depends what my client tells me to say. So uh, you can decide which hat I'm wearing in, in, uh, with each topic. Uh, and I should say, as a practitioner, I do, I do work with uh, the platforms here, particularly on trying to get data out of the platforms into the hands of the uh, research community. So I'm co-chair of something called Social Science One, which is an international effort to get Facebook uh, data outside of Facebook uh, into the hands of the research community to try to examine the impact of social media on democracy around the world. So uh, if you come to Stanford and you take my class on the First Amendment, uh, one of the first <coughs> concepts you learn about is the marketplace of ideas, right? It's that age-old concept, not unique to American constitutional law, but prominent in it, which is that the more speech that exists in the marketplace, the more competition that there is among ideas, the more likely that the truth is going to win out, right? Now, it's not clear that that was ever true, right, as a concept. It's certainly not true in the internet age. And all the more so, it's not true in an age characterized by rising artificial intelligence. Uh, so that while so much, so much of our, our jurisprudence and the way we think about free speech and democracy is predicated on this notion that an unregulated marketplace of ideas is going to be the best test for truth, that really has melted away as, I think, a, a, a critical concept uh, in the internet age. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should then be pro-censorship, right? There are plenty of other good arguments for protecting speech writ large, human rights arguments that don't depend on the marketplace of ideas. But as, so the idea of the marketplace of ideas is the best test for truth, I think, is no longer uh, viable in the internet and, and AI age. Second sort of meta point to make about um, uh, the effect of digital technologies on democracy is that how do democracies thrive and survive in an environment where uh, there is not basic agreement on facts and minimal trust in institutions, okay? This, uh, of course, it's not just the internet that has led to this rising distrust, right, where there's all kinds of, um, you know, uh, uh, sources for this rising distrust, both in the United States and around the world. I think as we think about the kind of meta questions about AI and democracy, though, as to whether authoritarian governments that predicate sort of policy goods on uh, AI inferences, AI uh, systems and the like, uh, that there's a kind of fundamental challenge to democracy if democracy is sort of is basing decisions on majoritarianism, <coughs> on, on free elections, going to be uh, able to, to compete with other systems, particularly you're thinking, of course, about China here, which bases policy delivery and, and government policy on sophisticated systems uh, governed by AI. Third point, again, meta point on the impact of, of digital technologies on democracy has to do with how we think about the campaign ecosystem and the information ecosystem as it relates um, to elections. So in general, we've always thought that um, you know, a sovereign government can control, in some ways, um, the information that its uh, population will get in the heat of an election, right? Now, of course, even before the rise of the internet or the rise of digital technologies, we in the US have a robust history of in intervening in other countries' elections, right? That's, it's not, the Russian incursion in the 2016 election in the US was not the first time a uh, foreign government tried to uh, affect another country's elections. But what AI and uh, other digital technologies do is they pose this question, which is how can a government essentially wall off its campaign ecosystem from foreigners and non-humans, okay? So we've generally thought of the speech that occurs in a uh, campaign ecosystem to be from human citizens. Now we have the problem of sort of, uh, you know, uh, widespread international intervention in different countries' elections and that a lot of this speech is done by bots, right? Now, there's an open question as to how influential and how big an impact bots have had, and I can talk a little bit about that, but it poses a kind of fundamental question for how we think about um, 
uh, the campaign ecosystem when a lot of the speech, in fact, the majority of speech online right now, right, is not being generated by humans, it's being generated uh, by machines. So those are the kind of meta questions. And now let me kind of drill down into what I think are the um, particular areas where new digital technologies have um, uh, placed stress on democracy. And I should say, just as a preface, of course, there are two sides to this coin, right? That these are technologies that can be used for good or ill, right? Um, um, what I'm describing here is, uh, you know, not that the, the technologies <coughs> themselves are inherently evil, right? It's how people are going to be uh, using them. But I think there's, there are reasons to think that, that the internet in general, AI in particular, poses a challenge to democracy, right, that is unprecedented. Um, and so here are the, and, and the way I ask the question is to think not about something like fake news or hate speech, because fake news is as old as news, hate speech is as old as speech, right? The question is, what is it about the technologies themselves that cause stresses on democracy with respect to things like the marketplace of ideas or uh, the process of elections and, and popular consent and democratic deliberation and the like? I should say I have a book coming out with Josh Tucker on social media and democracy, which goes into detail on some of these uh, questions that I'm only gonna talk about for 10 minutes. Um, so first, what, what, you know, what, uh, what particular stresses did new digital technologies uh, pose for democracy? There's a family of characteristics under the rubrics of velocity, virality, and volume. The speed at which information travels, the fact that it's done through viral peer-to-peer -peer transfer, and the sheer amount of information that we carry around on our cell phones every day, right? So first on the velocity point, right? So, uh, You've probably heard that saying, right? A lie makes its way halfway around the world before it's, the truth puts its boots on. Have you heard that expression, right? If you look on the internet, it's attributed to Mark Twain in 1917. Turns out Mark Twain was dead by 1917, so it's a little bit of sort of fake news about fake, fake news. news. Yeah, uh, but this, but the, the point still holds, right? Which is that the speed that information travels, um, particularly again, the internet is an exacerbator of that as well as uh, AI in some respects. Um, it poses a challenge for democracy itself, right? And why democracy in particular? And that is because elections occur at a particular point in time. And so well-placed lies in the run-up to an election have the capacity to have influence now in ways that they never did. Now, of course, we've always worried about like October surprises uh, in the US, right? Last minute uh, breaking news that would have an effect on an election, but when it comes to um, uh, you know the, the internet age, we are uh, it's not just late breaking news, but we do not have the referees as to what is going to get a national audience, right? That we did in the legacy media information ecosystem, right? And that's because we've now placed primacy on virality, right, as the coin of the political realm, as to what kinds of candidacies, strategies, and communication are then going to be privileged in uh, the audience that they receive. And so we've moved from a situation which had lots of uh, uh, downsides to it, when you had three white guys on the evening news who were the ones who were the referees as to what people could hear, right? Uh, as uh, you know, remember what Walter Cronkite used to say at the end of every broadcast, that's just the way it is, right? There's no way that anyone today, right, will have the credibility to say, well, that's just the way it is. Um, but that was, that was uh, you know, in some ways a more authoritarian way of uh, capturing the news and saying what was legitimate information that the population should share or, or to, to, be, to experience. Uh, now we've shifted to a information ecosystem that privileges virality and the AI systems that, exact, that, that figure out um, what types of information and communication will go viral. And we know as political scientists the kinds of communication and strategies and candidacies that are privileged in an environment like that. And that is um, the kind of strategies and communication that uh, appeal to emotion and appeal particularly to outrage. Uh, it is still the case that, you know, some other emotions like love go viral. That's why you have so many cat videos in your newsfeed, right? Uh, but, um, uh, we know that the, that the more outrageous, the more salacious, the more sensationalist, the more likely that something is uh, going to go viral. And then, as I said, the third phenomenon, right, is the sheer amount of information that we have at our fingertips um, through our cell phones that requires some kind of curation, right? And, and the big platforms are the ones that, that do that. Um, 
what that means, as I'll talk about toward the end, is that the decisions that the, what the platforms, the, the decisions that the platforms make with respect to what is in bounds and what is out of bounds are incredibly important and in many ways more important than what government, uh, the government laws in these areas. All right, so those, that's the first, sort of first family of phenomena. The second has to do with anonymity, right? And so, uh, if, again, if you take my First Amendment class, you learn, right, that anonymous speech is constitutionally protected in the United States. We have a long tradition of protecting anonymous speakers, right? You have a constitutional right to circulate uh, pamphlets under, you know, without putting your name uh, on them, even if the government forces you to. And after all, the Federalist Papers were written by Publius, right? After all, you've, you've seen the play. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so anonymity is protected. Um, and for that matter, when you look at, um, you know, wh whether it's the Arab Spring or protesters in Hong Kong or, or, or all around the world, anonymity is a critical uh, component <coughs> of internet communication in order for dissidents in authoritarian regimes. That being said, right, it is the anonymity that is privileged on the internet which gives us the bot problem, right, and gives us the unaccountable speech problem, all right? So, um, uh, as I said, there is a, a big debate as to how big a deal bots are online in terms of their impact. For the most part, um, bots trick other bots, right? And so this is, this is where, you know, the, the AI uh, issues come in. Um, so much of uh, what bots do is try to elevate topics and, and posts on search engines and in trending news feeds and the like. Uh, but we are rapidly reaching up a point where you will not be able to tell the difference between a machine and a human being that you're talking to online. Uh, even today, for, for some, uh, in some situations, I think that's difficult. And that goes to the kind of crux of the marketplace of ideas, right? Because um, the marketplace of ideas is kind of pre predicated on the notion that you will have, that the speaker kind of has skin in the game when you're talking, right? And that the, the competition among ideas is um, sort of, you weigh the credibility of the speaker, right, in this kind of interchange among ideas so that then, you, then the truth might actually be able uh, to win out. When uh, computational propaganda and, and bots and, and uh, you know, everything in between now essentially pollutes the marketplace of ideas, right? some of the critical competition that is uh, you know, fundamental to the way we think about how speech works in, works in democracy then really gets distorted. Right? And so again, the, the bot problem, and, and as, as Renee has educated me in, in thinking about the bot bills that have been out there, it's becoming increasingly difficult even to define what a bot is, right? Because it's not as if, uh, you may know this app called Bot or Not, it's not as if it, it's an on-off toggle, it's this in, incredible continuum of sort of machine-aided uh, individual speech and where we draw the line becomes increasingly important and difficult. And like I said, it, it poses a real challenge for democracy and how you might regulate th this kind of computational propaganda. Uh, related again to, uh, with anonymity <coughs> is what I was talking about with respect to virality. But not only are you unable to, to decide or, or, or see whether the person on the other side of the screen is actually a human being, but you're also, uh, you under conditions of anonymity, you will engage in less accountable speech, right, than you would if you had to experience face-to-face, -face, um, uh, you know, sanction and the like. And so, uh, whether it's hate speech or other kinds of inciting speech, right, the internet uh, facilitates that, and we've seen, you know, plenty of examples of that. Um, third sort of family of uh, phenomenon is what we call homophily or echo chambers and filter bubbles. So, homophily, homophily, yes, yeah, there's, you know, um, there's your, you know, uh, uh, 70 point Scrabble word for the day. Um, uh, so, um, there, is a, there is, again, a debate as to whether our online lives are really more homophilous than our offline lives. In fact, Matt Jenskow in this building has, has done some of the best research on this, saying, you know, actually, online, we tend to see people that we don't actually see in our neighborhood or in our, or, or in our other sort of media consumption. And so it's not clear that digital technologies have actually led to people self-selecting into homogeneous media echo chambers, right? I mean, that's kind of the conventional wisdom that uh, you know, most people are you know, either they're, they're getting into a conservative rabbit hole and that's what they're seeing on Facebook or, or Twitter and the like, or a liberal one. Um, but in, t in many respects, um, people who use the social media platforms end up being exposed to their weak ties online 
because we all have that uncle who posts on Facebook, right? And so this is someone who we might only see at Thanksgiving dinners, but now um, this person seems to be up 24 hours a day posting different links right from their favorite news sites. And, the, and, and often these are not gonna be the people that you're gonna run into into your neighborhood. Um, and uh, like I said, the question is, as compared to what? Now, where the research on homophily or media echo chambers has moved is beyond the question as to whether most people live in these echo chambers. Uh, to who lives in these echo chambers. And this is where I think some of the AI technologies come in because the flip side of echo chambers really is about micro-targeting, right? And the ability to deliver to someone uh, sort of a, a prearranged menu of information and communication which is perfectly suited to their tastes and uh, dispositions, right? And so if you had to, I mean, when it comes to the social media universe, if you had to identify the area where AI is being most used, it's in advertising, right? An ungodly amount of um, uh, uh, the communication, right? The, the, and, and this, or of the AI techniques that are being used has to do with targeting, figuring out what would persuade groups of people um, to buy X or Y. Um, but then also, as we get talk about politics, whether it's political advertising or even organic content, um, it's not an echo chamber per se that you have opted into, but one that has been sort of pre-selected for you in the targeting that is being uh, done uh, uh, with respect to advertising. Um, our own Michal uh, uh, Kosinski here at, at Stanford has done an enormous amount of work on how predictive these models can be. Um, you know, the, the downside of all that or the, the, the dark example of that, of course, is Cambridge Analytica and everything that they were trying to do. Most people think they were a bunch of snake oil salesmen who really couldn't do what they were saying, but there are firms out there now who can, who can achieve this. Um, fourth uh, uh, and, and fifth phenomena, both uh, related, when we start thinking about digital technologies and democracy, has to do with sovereignty and monopoly, right? So I mentioned the sovereignty problem before, uh, that uh, you know, the, the ability of someone in the internet age to, um, not just uh, someone, but a government to have an impact on an election outside of their, um, outside of their borders. Uh, and so obviously we've seen this with, with Russia. Um, the, my colleagues here can talk a little bit more about the AI techniques that are used in, in, with respect to that. Um, but if you talk to the Europeans, right, they think about the sovereignty <coughs> problem in a, in a more expansive way. It's not just about, say, you know, Russia or another country having an impact on their democracies. It's about US technology companies having an effect on European democracy, right? Uh, and it's not just Europe, obviously around the world. So that uh, Facebook and Google, uh, because of their, their sort of preeminent position um, in regulating the information ecosystem, have uh, really power which is unmasked in the, unmatched in the history of telecommunication, maybe only matched by um, the pre-Reformation Catholic Church, right, in their ability to control the information environment. Uh, and so it's not just about one country having an impact on another country's election systems. It's about US technology companies which have a particular view of free speech and free expression, something that Maricha Shaki talked about yesterday in her talk. Uh, and, it's not, and it's not like the sort of typical view of US economic imperialism that say, you know, that Disney movies are polluting French culture or something like that. It's about a view of free speech, right? It's about what types of information uh, and speech is going to be protected in this environment and whether it's going to be, um, you know, sort of US values that are then gonna dominate these other political systems. And so related to that is, is this point about monopoly, right? And I'll end with this, uh, which is that the, the um, monopoly position of Google and Facebook, both in the US and around the world, uh, means that their terms of service and community guidelines and how they govern AI, how they govern uh, speech on their platforms are in many ways more important than formal law when it comes to um, uh, the kind of speech that's going to be allowed in campaigns, elections, and, and democracies generally. The, um, to end on an anecdote, when Nick Clegg, the vice president of Facebook, former deputy prime minister of Great Britain, uh, went to Europe in the spring last year, or of this year, to uh, talk about Facebook and the European parliamentary elections, he announced what would be the rules for political advertising for the European elections, right? 
Just digest that for a second, right? That you have an executive of a US technology company who is announcing what the rules are going to be for political uh, advertising uh, across the EU. And so we have reached a completely sort of new world uh, when it comes to uh, who are the uh, authorities in charge of, of political debate, who are going to be uh, setting the rules. And I should say, we here at the Cyber Policy Center are trying to grapple with that. We have a, a diverse group of, of thinkers, uh, former industry, civil society, uh, politicians, uh, and academics trying to grapple with those questions. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Renee. Hi, I'm Renee Duresta. I'm research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory. So what we focus on there, our kind of subset of the, uh, the broader organization, is to look at uh, sort of three buckets of activity. The first is proactive detection of emerging influence operations. Uh, the second is forensic analysis of, uh, of operations past. And the last piece is what we can understand tactically and conceptually about the technologies and the processes that drive these campaigns as we observe them in aggregate over a period of multiple years uh, to assist policymakers in understanding a little bit better how they can react to them and how we should think about uh, the threat they pose and uh, the truly global nature of the problem at this point. So, one of the things I will say is that we focus um, quite a bit about on the impact of AI on elections. But one of the more interesting questions uh, is the impact of AI on consensus building, consensus processes, uh, persuasion, consensus reality. And elections are kind of a structural sub-process that's executed in service to thinking about how uh, we as a nation or anywhere in the world come to consensus. And the challenges when we talk about election interference, polarization, homophily, are kind of sub-problems that are impacting that idea of uh, finding agreement, bridging gaps, operating from a shared basis of fact. Uh, and one of the things that I'm going to discuss briefly is very specifically uh, the operation that we saw in the US, the Internet Research Agency, since that's the one that is public, um, is, uh, is the work that we do on understanding how the election was actually a very small subcomponent to a much larger operation. And when we say societal division, I think of that actually as the, the process of um, impacting that ability to reach consensus by creating a perception in people's minds of the world that they live in, uh, what their neighbors think, uh, what, their, what the people around them think, what the media thinks. And so the mirage uh, that foreign propagandists and influence operations can create that changes a person's perception uh, to the point where they are seeing content, uh, at, you know, the prevalence of inauthentic content and coordinated activity makes it so that they see something that is not necessarily reflective of what we would consider to be reality. So one of the uh, interesting things that we see with the Internet Research Agency was they did first partition society into three groups that they thought were at odds with each other. And with that kind of basic partitioning, that basic targeting, they could create practices and frameworks that allowed them to reach each of these three audiences where they were uh, and, and drive a further wedge into the very real rifts uh, underlying relationships between these groups. And so we saw left-leaning communities of content on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I should just caveat by saying it's all over the internet. Uh, a lot of times the focus is on the big platforms. That's because they've amassed the broadest audiences. Uh, and when you have that audience amassing, you become a target because a propagandist needs an audience and these platforms have them kind of right for the picking. But so we had the left-leaning community, we had the right-leaning community, and then they treated the community of black Americans actually as a separate third distinct group, uh, which is a very important and interesting distinction because it felt that they felt that they could drive wedges on racial issues between both the left and the black community and between both the black and the right community. Uh, so there's an interesting partition there where you see the election is actually a much, much smaller it's, a, it's an opportunistic moment in time. It's a discrete challenge where they can have a tangible impact, but it's actually this process of, um, of consensus building that is the, the more important focus of the operation. So one of the things that you see in terms of how this is executed is you see issues that are of national importance presented with very different inflections depending on who the end target is. So a 
meme that is challenging the right of Hillary Clinton to be a presidential candidate is inflected very differently for the black community versus the left-leaning community. For the left-leaning community, they might go after it as this is, uh, she's a fake feminist. Uh, for the uh, black American community, they're leaning into actually a lot more of the stuff that uh, Bill Clinton did that, that they were able to piggyback on related to um, incarceration, the drug war, and these other issues. So you have that message that's put out there with different inflections, same topic, sometimes the same meme, uh, but depending on the propaganda that goes along with it and the targeting that's applied to it, people see the issue or are encouraged to see the issue in these vastly divergent ways. Um, some of the work that we did looked at the inter-networking and interlinking of these accounts, which is a really important piece in how to conduct an influence operation. We called it the media mirage. Um, but the idea is once you're part of this community, uh, as, as Nate mentioned with the um, the echo chamber, so to speak, what you're actually seeing is content not only from the page that you're following, but from the pages that are related to it. And so they build an entire network such that if you engage with them on one piece of content or one page, the inadvertent algorithmic amplification from the platforms that you're seeing the material on, and the fact that they're cross-promoting their own content without making it clear that they're running all of the pages, ensures that once you've engaged, after a particular point of engagement, this actually does become uh, one of the kind of a dominant um, framework where they're carefully working to insert themselves into real communities. So in the black community in particular, you'll see fake pages amplifying real things like uh, African-American owned small businesses doing this cross promotion so that they in turn will cross promote them back. So there's this interesting phenomenon of um, the, there's the kind of inadvertent filter bubble, the stuff that is just um, an, an accidental happenstance of uh, an algorithmic side effect versus this next layer where there's a much more deliberate attempt to capitalize on those algorithmic structures for purposes of further manipulation. And then the last thing I'll say on the IRA specifically is um, kind of a good bridge, I think, actually, because it's the idea of impact. So, so much of the focus on the, uh, you know, the um, conversation about how disinformation and influence operations affect democracy does focus on the election outcome, when in reality, one of the things that we continue to see is actually the content that they created continuing, continuing to be shared uh, in the communities that they targeted with it. So there's the idea of influence as, again, that form of receptivity. Is this a, do you give someone a message that they internalize and then independently spread? Because that's a point where it ceases to be necessarily an influence operation uh, and becomes something that you have to deal with a little bit. Uh, it gets into a very gray area. At, you know, at what point should the platform continue to take down if the message has actually been internalized by a community and then spread voluntarily by that community? So. That's kind of the, um, you know, I can talk more about the IRA, but I actually wanted to get at the, what I've just described there is generating content, uh, generating consensus through persuasion or generating dissensus through persuasion. And so I think that the technologies that facilitate or otherwise enhance our ability to persuade uh, are actually the ones that we need to be looking at going forward. Um, one of the, the process that I just described from 2014 to 2017 actually did not use anything that I would personally characterize as sophisticated AI from a technological perspective. It's using the algorithms that are there, it's using the ecosystem that is there, uh, but in the interest of being forward looking, I'm gonna talk a little bit about actual technologies uh, that are kind of in the pipeline today and how we're thinking about red teaming out what their potential is uh, for use in more sophisticated operations in the future. So one of the things that we look at um, at SIO uh, that Alex and I are working on right now is actually how can we think about these operations um, in aggregate? So not just Russia, that's the one that gets the most attention because we're here in the US, but there are about, I think uh, some folks at Princeton put out a paper with a database of 54 operations that have been carried out over the last three years or so. And so a lot of what we're thinking about is what can we understand about influence operations as process uh, for the purpose of better understanding quantitatively how to detect earlier, disrupt earlier, because once you're reporting on it or doing the forensics after the fact, uh, the impact has been made. So generally speaking, influence operations involve a combination of uh, actors, content, and means of dissemination. So the actors, um, traditionally, this is where you see the fake accounts. Again, in 2016, the conversation was almost exclusively around bots. Almost nothing that the Internet Research Agency did that was impactful was with bots. It was all with human-controlled accounts. Um, but there, again, in every single operation, there are these malign accounts. And one of the interesting things that um, we see is how those accounts are created, developed, 
um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. The content part, as I refer to it, is what they're actually spreading. So that's the memes, long form narratives. There's actually kind of like two parallel tracks and in influence operations uh, related to, I would say, uh, thinking about consensus. One is mimetic. Uh, mimetic content, so memes and things that are intended to be reshared by regular people. Uh, participatory propaganda, the intent is to inspire you to go on to take an action, uh, to go on and further share it, and so part of the process involves targeting you with the thing that you are most likely to go on and, and share. The other aspect of it, though, is the long form, uh, the long form content, which is much more the creation of fake journalists, fake accounts that are designed to write long form propaganda, and that actually is to operate on things like uh, search results algorithms, um, excuse me, such that if you come up with a term or a keyword that someone is likely to search for, and your propaganda is the top page of results for that search term, uh, that's how you can ensure that you retain a sort of intellectual dominance over, uh, over a conversation. Intellectual is maybe the wrong word. <laughs> machine, you know, machine generated dominance over a conversation. Prominent example of this would be the narratives around the white helmets. If you search for the white helmets, you'll see almost exclusively uh, RT content at this point. And then the process for dissemination is how the fake actors get their fake content or their manipulative content uh, in front of people. And so there are dissemination pathways. One of the really interesting areas of research is how can we quantify and understand those distribution pathways because that's a way to do kind of content agnostic searching to try to understand um, more the mechanisms of virality and peer-to-peer -peer transmission uh, that allow these, these things to spread versus the ones that, uh, that fizzle. So, I think that there's three areas in which AI has uh, significant potential impact in the near future. So the first is the significant potential to reduce the cost of content creation. So to reduce the cost of uh, the creation of persuasive content. And I'll just get deep fakes out of the way very quickly because I know Andy's gonna be talking about that. Um, a deep fake is different than a shallow fake or edited content in that it is generated by the AI rather than modified from existing footage. Um, one of the interesting challenges with deep fakes, again, is the, the sensational content, uh, the way that it engages with the algorithm in theory, is that sensational content is privileged, likely to spread farther. By the time the correction comes out, the deep fake has already gone viral, and a sufficient number of people are going to believe that whatever was uh, created in the video actually happened. Um, I think right now these video deepfakes are useful primarily as a tool for blackmail for ordinary people. I think they're much more useful in revenge porn than they are in, uh, in, in real kind of election situations. That's because with the video, at least, there is a potential for detection. So one of the questions that we have right now is um, the technology by itself is interesting. The technology plus uh, the dissemination or distribution pathway is where the real threat, I would say, is. Um, the, an interesting side effect of uh, deep fakes existing and people being aware of them is that they are increasingly allowing for the dismissal of authentic shocking video. There was an example of this recently in Malaysia where a government minister was caught with another man uh, on video and his response was, that's not me, that's a deep fake. Um, another area that's interesting, I think, on the, on the generated content front um, is, uh, is audio deep fakes. I think that's actually a much, much more interesting more easy to produce, um, more easy to produce without things like video artifacts that make it uh, easily, easier to detect. Um, so this is where you could do something like create a fake hot mic video. Uh, so we've all seen the impact of real hot mic videos on election conversations. This is an area where audio deepfakes have the potential to, um, again, either facilitate the creation of a fake hot mic or be used to uh, discourage belief in a real uh, hot mic. Uh, even more basic than that, we get to generated text. I think that is actually one of the unique underrated threats. Um, a lot of how we detect information operations right now is by looking at how the actors screw up. Uh, a lot of the time they are sloppy, they reuse their text. Uh, you may have seen this if you've ever seen an article written by um, anybody who like studies bots on Twitter, you'll see the verbatim uh, you know, the verbatim content, and so there are ways to look for, um, again, either verbatim content or some of the things we've seen with Russia is um, keyboard characters that are not unique, to, that, that are not um, authentic to, uh, to American, key that are not on American keyboards even. Um, so we look at some of the ways in which our understanding of text and repetition 
uh, as we have it right now, there are abilities to identify operations. One would be, for example, purely domestically, the FEC comment call around net neutrality had millions of fake comments, uh, but one of the ways that the researchers found that was because they had used relatively small corpus of text, and even though they generated a pile of comments from that text, it all still kind of came down to a, it, it, there was enough of a similarity uh, that researchers were able to detect this. When you have generated text, uh, that is where you cease to have this kind of easily detectable corpus, and so the challenge is uh, how quickly do you find it? Um, another thing that is very interesting about that is uh, with generative text, you do have the ability to really shape people's perception of what ordinary people are thinking. So China has done this for a very long time with the 50 Cent Army, the idea that, and then that is not um, automated, those are real people, but it's the idea that you can now use technology to execute on tactics that have been demonstrably effective when done with real people while eliminating perhaps the the giveaways and the uh, error-prone areas. So you achieve the same result. People see these comments, they begin to believe that this is a dominant point of view. Um, it is used to manufacture consensus, we call it, or create a majority illusion where there is none. So that's creation. Uh, second, there's AI with the potential to improve the distribution of persuasive content. So we still don't have a, the most, I, I would say, robust understanding of impact, um, but we do understand mechanisms of distribution. So what that means is we know how people get content in front of people. We don't necessarily understand when and how it's internalized. But just in terms of showing it to them, you'll see more sophisticated automated accounts. They'll do a better job of evading Twitter's detection algorithms. Uh, and then there's the reinforcement learning processes, the algorithmic recommendations, the curation, uh, the targeting that Nate was describing. That is constantly improving, and so you do see a greater and greater degrees of precision in what is shown to whom. And then third, and this is kind of an emergent area, um, AI has the potential to be misused in the context of in, uh, interpersonal relationship persuasion. So per the um, discussion of who we trust and, and how we trust them, there is a body of research that shows that if you are spending extensive amounts of time with people, there is a degree of trust. One of the areas that we see with um, uh, kind of fandoms and um, interesting kind of tight-knit factions on the internet is the degree to which people really, even though even if they have no idea who's on the other end of the account, uh, will engage in the account. There's a camaraderie there. There's a desire to participate in a community. And so this is where we start to see right now um, that is that requires human operators uh, in order to engage in those relationships. But what we're starting to see is increasingly sophisticated things like chatbots that have the potential to allow those kinds of operations to scale up much more dramatically. Um, similarly, when creating manipulative personas, there's GANs generated faces. This is extremely low hanging fruit. Um, if you go to thispersondoesnotexist.com, it auto generates one, I think every time you refresh the page. And uh, one of the things that we've traditionally used to understand whether an account is part of a manipulative influence operation is to reverse image search it or go through a collection of image searching to identify that, that face as it appears elsewhere on the internet. You'd be surprised how often you'll see sloppiness, using stock photos, stealing real people's pictures, grabbing models off Pinterest, that's always the best. Um, when you use GANs generated faces, uh, you eliminate the ability to have that, uh, that first wave of, of detection. Um, and then finally, an area that is uh, under research right now in, uh, in DARPA, is what do we do when spear phishing becomes automated? Because one of the things that we saw with, again, just reverting to Russia again, is um, the hack and leak operations. And the extent to which democracy, uh, the, that particular facet of the operation, had perhaps the most profound impact on the national conversation. The hack and leak of the DNC, um, the hack and leak of the Clinton campaign, which were conducted through spear phishing operations. Spear phishing is uh, somebody sends you an email and you click on it and you go and you enter your credentials or you, you know, inadvertently uh, find yourself downloading some malware. So what we're talking about here is there is, if you've ever gotten a bad spear phishing email, the English will be bad, the, you know, there'll be something about it that um, sort of the uncanny valley of uh, suspicion is aroused. Um, but one of the things that, that um, researchers are looking at now is active social engineering defense, operating under the belief that increasingly spear phishing attacks uh, will not fall prey to the 
again, um, grammatical or other errors, uh, they will be automatically generated and they will be highly personalized based on encounters that you actually do have uh, in your online world. So you are talking about a particular thing on Twitter, uh, you mention getting something on Amazon Prime, so ways in which they'll be able to mine textual history of targets and then in turn generate uh, email campaigns and other things to reach people with, uh, with more tailored, targeted, applicable, um, legitimate looking messages. So there are many persuasion and disinformation applications for AI technologies. These are just a handful that were kind of top of mind for me. Um, and they can be used to target our processes of, uh, of coming to consensus in addition to, so again, the longer scale thing around consensus, the shorter scale thing around the election. Um, and this is an arms race. So emerging technology, if not properly red teamed, uh, will generally favor the aggressor. Um, and so one of the things that we are talking about in our policy conversations is who bears responsibility for thinking about evolving technological capabilities uh, and the context in which they can be deployed. Thank you, Renee. Thanks for scaring us. <laughs> Sophisticated automated spear phishing. That's one of the most scary things in my life. But uh, let's come back to that. Uh, Andy. Great. So what's a democracy to do about all this? Um, so what I would like to do is have us put our, our hard hats on. And uh, what I want to do is, is present you uh, a methodology for managing problems uh, at the intersection of technology and public policy. And I'll use uh, synthetic media, deep fakes, uh, call it what you will, as kind of a, a case study for how to put, put a methodology like this um, into practice. Uh, to give you just a little bit more background about where I come from uh, on this, uh, I am, I am a, a recovering swamp creature. Um, I uh, began my career at a think tank in Washington, D.C. I uh, took, uh, in between that stint and, and here, uh, back in academia, I took eight or nine years in government. I worked uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee staff, um, uh, worked uh, at an agency, and then, uh, as, as Mike said, um, was the senior director for cyber policy uh, on the National Security Council at the White House. Um, and I think I may be one of the few people on the planet who uh, had that had a job like that uh, in both the Obama and the Trump administration. Um, and so I, you know, so I, I, I sort of bring, a, a, you know, I try to bring a, a, a um, you know, in essence, you know, what I'm going to describe is how, if I were back in government, uh, how I would tackle a problem like, 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 like say, uh, um, synthetic media in, in politics. Um, at, at its core, this methodology identif uh, involves identifying a big problem. Uh, breaking it down into as many smaller target areas as possible, and then developing policy interventions tailored uh, to those uh, smaller target areas. Uh, individually, um, the, the interventions aimed at smaller targets may be relatively small in effect. Uh, collectively, however, uh, many small interventions uh, can add up to having a significant impact on the bigger problem. Um, typically, implementing an approach along the lines of what I'm about to lay out requires presidential leadership. Uh, and particularly if uh, we're talking about a process uh, that, that either emerges from the executive branch or the Congress, uh, requires um, uh, effective management by, um, by leaders uh, and their deputies because uh, developing uh, and implementing an approach like this uh, typically requires a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different um, points of, of, of input for, for expertise and insight. Uh, so the challenge, m many of the most pressing national security and foreign policy challenges uh, facing the United States involve digital technologies. Um, in domains as varied as enhancing the resilience of critical infrastructure against cyber threats, uh, sustaining America's global <coughs> leadership in innovation and countering disinformation campaigns, the features and limitations of digital technologies are part of the problem, part of the solution, or oftentimes both. Um, technology literacy is therefore a, an increasingly vital skill uh, for policy decision makers to possess. Uh, and the relative scarcity uh, of such uh, literacy in Washington, D.C., and the growing awareness among policymakers about this skills gap has resulted in an increased emphasis on the need to incorporate technologists and te technological expertise into national security and other policy making processes. This is, this is a welcome development. On the other hand, these, these challenges are almost never just technology problems, uh, nor manageable with technology solutions alone. Uh, indeed, complex problems by definition have many dimensions that uh, often elude simple solutions. Uh, the problem is that policymakers crave silver bullets, but they seldom exist uh, when it comes to challenges like these. 
us. And, and so more often than not, it, um, Addressing them requires uh, breaking down a problem into smaller pieces and trying to tailor interventions accordingly. Now, I want to demonstrate um, this, this methodology um, using synthetic media, which uh, is, a, is a more encompassing term than deep fakes. Uh, synthetic media is essentially AI-generated content. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the application of this technology uh, by malicious actors and propaganda uh, campaigns targeting elected officials and other political figures. So video footage uh, in particular is typically accepted at face value as documenting uh, an actual event. Um, as we know, um, the, these new tools uh, um, are relying on advances in machine learning and data analytics threatens to append uh, video's reputation for authenticity by making it possible uh, to generate fake videos and other fake content at low cost and with rapidly uh, improving realism. In essence, uh, media, video or otherwise, uh, will soon be e as easy to forge as written text. Um, AI-generated synthetic uh, media, as, as Renee mentioned, uh, can also come in the form of text, uh, audio, uh, photo, or any combination of them. The underlying technology um, has many uh, beneficial applications uh, in film production and other domains uh, that drive investment. Uh, for example, a movie director could, could use the tools to create uh, or re recreate scenes without having to reassemble um, the original cast uh, or a traditional crew, as was done uh, uh, to famous effect recently in, in Rogue One. Um, like uh, most technologies, however, of course, this, this one also has malicious applications. And one such application is a foreign adversary or other malicious actor using synthetic media as part of a propaganda campaign aimed at undermining Americans' confidence uh, in, in their political institutions, uh, amplifying social divisions um, among us, and, and denigrating candidates for office. Uh, for example, uh, synthetic media could falsely depict a candidate or other figure uh, engaged in politically damaging behavior or worse yet, be crafted to incite violence against uh, vulnerable groups. What to me that points to is sort of a, a, the beginning of a working definition of how we think about what, what is a malicious, uh, what, what is a, an example of a malicious synthetic media in politics. So I would, I would present that uh, it has the contours or something along the lines of it depicts a candidate doing something they didn't do uh, without that candidate's consent. Um, now, political messaging um, is, is part and parcel of the democratic process, uh, contributes to how issues are framed and, and which issues uh, rise to salience on the political agenda and ultimately has persuasive uh, and mobilizing effect on prospective voters. Uh, the effects may not always be large, and this is a, a topic that, 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 political, that social scientists continue to debate, uh, but given the razor, razor thin uh, margins of victory in many jurisdictions in the United States, um, especially swing states, uh, e even small effects can have significant impact on election outcomes. Uh, we also know from a long line of social science research that negative political messaging in particular can be especially impactful on audiences uh, because it tends to be rich in information, uh, plays to viewers' emotions, and achieves uh, relatively higher degrees of novelty, which earns additional coverage from the media, and regardless of the truthfulness of its content can amplify its spread on social media. Uh, as Renee mentioned, real videos that capture politically salient moments are already fixtures of, of political discourse, whether recorded by a hot mic uh, with rolling video, in the case of the infamous uh, Access Hollywood video with Donald Trump, uh, filmed by an alert witness in the case of uh, Eric Garner's death, or discovered in archives uh, in the case of Pastor uh, Jeremiah Wright's sermons. These videos are powerful because they, the persons depicted in them uh, literally speak or, or act uh, for themselves. They feature the ultimate source cue about the authenticity of the content. And in these cases, moreover, the content is negative um, in the sense they document embarrassing legal, um, uh, embarrassing illegal or other controversial behavior by the persons depicted in them. Unfortunately, uh, deep fake synthetic media are ideally suited for negative political messaging. Uh, an author can literally put words in a person's mouth and, and command their behavior in a format that audiences, uh, at least so far, are accustomed to accepting as an authentic, authoritative record of reality. Uh, in addition, uh, making and airing synthetic uh, media does not require uh, actors, crew, filmmakers, permits, specialized equipment, cooperative weather, purchased airtime, all that, that stuff you need to produce um, political advertising. Uh, instead, a would-be author needs uh, a commodity computer with the right performance characteristics, deepfake software, uh, access to sufficient data to train the algorithm, an online platform for airing and distributing, and so on. A, a much, much lower uh, set, uh, set of barriers to, to entry. 
Um, deepfake content has a high potential for achieving the type of novelty that results in earned media coverage and viral spread across the internet. Um, and the risks to, to civic discourse is implied by research on uh, polarization and the effects of electronic media include reduced trust in institutions, increasingly disengaged citizens, and a misinformed electorate. Uh, now, just as Note that that research, uh, the, the, the research state of the art on this is still developing, as, as Nate mentioned. Um, but uh, you know, the, if you're thinking about this as a vector uh, or a magic eight ball, you know, all signs point to negative. Um, major platforms uh, such as Twitter, Google, and YouTube, Facebook are potential choke points uh, for the spread of deep fakes. Um, but for them to take effective action at scale, uh, there would have to be not only some measure of societal consensus on the circumstances under which a deep fake crosses a line uh, into malicious, dangerous, dangerous territory, the platforms would also have to be capable of reliably uh, identifying such deep fakes in the first place. Uh, there are technological methods uh, for identifying uh, deep fakes. Renee covered a few of them, um, but none of them are silver bullets. Uh, for example, forensic efforts detect artifacts or tells of synthetic content as a way of identifying and potentially taking remedial action against them are important. Uh, DARPA has a program uh, called Metaphor uh, that's funding research to, to, to develop robust uh, detectors that operate this way. Uh, uh, detecting irregular blinking is one uh, example that, that made the news, uh, I think it was earlier this year. These techniques are promising and certainly worth continued support, but they're also inherently fragile uh, because the algorithms used to train uh, a given generation of synthetic content can be retrained to eliminate or uh, reduce that artifact and evade detection. Uh, I'll note as well the deepfake detection Detection Challenge recently lost, launched by Facebook and researchers from academia and civil society will also likely produce important techniques along with performance benchmarking. Uh, other approaches such as cryptographically signing authoritative, authentic videos to distinguish them from fakes or uh, asking political figures to submit to total surveillance as an antidote to fabricated uh, scenes uh, suffer from, from technical um, and or practical shortcomings. In other words, technology must be part of the response but it cannot be the entire response. So let me, let me dive a little bit now into the methodology. So breaking down a big challenge like Moses deep fakes into smaller target areas yields, in my view, uh, numerous possibilities for more tailored interventions. Um, now, there will often be different ways to break a problem like this down, uh, and the approach taken will have a framing effect on the nature of the problem and appropriate interventions, so it should be made with this potential source of bias in mind. Um, for deep fakes, uh, I would suggest that one way to break the, the problem down, and this, this, this uh, picks up a little bit on uh, the point Renee made about the different stages that, that, that a, a propaganda camp campaign has to go through, is to think about uh, the stages that the author of uh, malicious synthetic media have to go through in order to achieve their intended uh, adverse impact. So they have, to develop, they have to develop the content, they have to distribute it, they have to uh, amplify it, and, it, and then it needs to generate some adverse impact. Uh, now there's some fluidity across uh, these stages. The line between distribution and amplification uh, can be blurry, uh, but the categories I think are generally robust and, and a reasonable place to start. And so for, then for each of these stages, we can begin to identify actors uh, whose actions or emissions have an impact on the ability of a malicious author to develop, distribute, and amplify uh, synthetic, uh, uh, malicious synthetic uh, media in pursuit of some adverse impact. Uh, so in the case of uh, development, right, you've got deep fake apps, uh, app distributors such as you know, development platforms, um, app stores and search, uh, content creators and repositories, uh, so you know, digital camera man you know, uh, manufacturers, distribution, um, you've got the malicious authors themselves, uh, you've got fringe social media platforms, mainstream social media platforms, and so on. And th this is just a preliminary list for starters, but surveying a list and thinking about how to nudge or shape the incentives and behavior of these actors uh, yields a variety of intervention options. So for example, uh, if you think about app stores, uh, take Apple's app store. Uh, app stores and retailers, for example, could refuse to carry deep fake apps that did not implement some mechanism for identifying content as synthetic through a cryptographic signature. Uh, the president could direct uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, to work with industry to develop a standard for such identification. A standard would help platforms and other content hosts identify synthetic content more readily at machine speed, which is a necessary step for managing uh, malicious deep fakes at scale. Uh, Congress or state legislatures could even pass a law making deep fake app developers liable for damages under copyright and tort law. Uh, uh, for the damages caused by a malicious deepfake with a safe harbor for apps that implement a content provenance mechanism. 
or a legislature could ban the distribution of malicious deep fakes in the most sensitive period before elections, as California has done. Uh, many of you may, may know that earlier this month, Governor Newsom uh, signed a bill to this effect. Um, interventions along these lines uh, would, would cause the vast majority of deepfake authors to gravitate towards mainstream, easy to find applications that, that have the providence function. Uh, these applications would also likely be the ones that to attract the most investment to improve their capabilities and ease of use, giving them a competitive advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis applications that lack the providence function. Uh, malicious uh, content produced by casual users with these applications could be more readily ident identified. Uh, this approach would also funnel authors seeking to pass off synthetic media as real uh, towards a subset of applications. And, and now obviously this is not a silver bullet, uh, but it would narrow the scope of the problem. And these are just a few um, examples of inter intervention problems, of intervention options. All of them involve trade-offs and have their own costs, but I think it's important to begin to put some of these ideas on the table and be, so we can begin to, to, to compare and contrast. I want to end with a, a brief discussion of norms. Uh, much of the airtime given to uh, discussions about policy solutions uh, focuses on what technology companies can and cannot do. Uh, we can and should hold technology companies to a high standard of accountability when their products hurt people uh, and communities. Uh, but let's not forget the outsized role and influence that political leaders uh, in this country have on the tenor of our political discourse and what counts as legitimate and illegitimate methods of engagement. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think if political leaders resort to deep fakes as a legitimate tool of influence, uh, then no amount of intervention by technology companies uh, can prevent the rot that, that such behavior would, would introduce into our political discourse. I'm happy to talk uh, more about norms and synthetic media in, in the Q&A and how it might work. Um, but I would like to see, personally, <coughs> candidates uh, for office and elected officials make public commitments to exercise restraint when it comes to using deep fakes in political discourse. I made this argument um, two years ago when I testified before the California legislature in a joint uh, assembly Senate hearing on election security. And, and um, I, I'm pleased to, to say that that, that testimony uh, catalyzed a lot of the, the legislative output that we see. Uh, today uh, and, and that Governor Newsom signed earlier this month on synthetic media. So I'll, I'll stop there and look forward to your questions and answers. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> All right, we got a lot on the table. Um, I think we'll go till 2.40, just so you can plan. I, between 2.30 and 2.45, how about that? For, so you can plan your next move. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I, I wrote down a bunch of questions. I'm just going to ask them all and then do one more round and you can pick and choose because they don't actually fit neatly with all the presentations. Some are really small and some are really big and then we'll, we'll go to the audience, okay? So one more round. Uh, we'll start with you, Andy, and work <coughs> the other way around and just pick and choose. Take a few minutes, not, not 10 minutes, uh, uh, about a couple of these. So first, very small question. Um, I don't understand why Facebook just doesn't ban political ads. Um, and I want to understand why that's such an important thing for them to preserve, uh, given you know the other revenue streams they have. The, the upside, it seems to me, in terms of reputation, would be fantastic. Uh, but they're, I'm, I'm naive to this. I don't not understand this. So why not that? And why don't some countries just ban Facebook ads? And I'm using Facebook just because it's been in the news. But why is that such a, what would be wrong with that? Um, second, on spear phishing and deep fakes, uh, and, and I just want you, you both, and, and actually Nate too, because you've thought a lot about this, to dig a little deeper into who's responsible, how do we measure damage, right, as Andy, that you just said, um, and who pays for that defense, as, as Renee said. Um, help get into it a little bit thicker, and, and I just remind you that, you know, when um, our country is attacked, uh, we know who to call um, and uh, from an external actor. Uh, and we spend a lot of money, by the way, more than any country in the world, uh, to protect us against that kind of attack. Uh, when somebody breaks into a, a house here on campus, that's been happening frequently, by the way, lately, uh, we, I, there's a phone call to call, and we expect our government to protect us. Why is our government not responsible for protecting us from deep fakes? Why is our government not responsible from protecting us from spear phishing? I'm a target uh, of, from the Russians all the time 
in the digital world, why, why isn't the FBI helping me? Why isn't the 82nd Airborne helping me? Uh, why is it just me and the IT guy? Um, <laughs> which it is. And, uh, and, and why, is, why do we allow, to, I'm putting this in a provocative way, but why do we allow companies to provide us with products with, with just incredible deficiencies? You know, I, you know when I buy a, a, a Diet Coke, I don't expect to be poisoned from that. The government helps to make sure that happens. And yet, every time I get an email, I have to worry about being poisoned. Uh, why is that not Google's fault? Why is that not Gmail's fault or Stanford.edu? <coughs> help, help me us understand the liability issue and then who is to protect us, to echo something Renee said. Uh, third question. Um, the, the balance of power here between the government, the platform companies, and citizens. I, I want to I hear a little more about um, the way you all think about the, the way to change that balance of power. It reminds me, because you brought it up, Nate, about interventionists in other elections. Uh, I have a different phrase for it. We're not going to debate it. But I lived in Russia in 1992. Uh, I worked for a group called NDI. Uh, and we translated a bunch of handbooks called Kak Pabarit na if you speak Russian, how to win elections. Uh, by the way, we are affiliated with the Democratic Party, but we translated the Republicans' handbook uh, to, that we then propagated and handed out. And our targets were elites trying to win elections. But we were invited by the government. I want to emphasize that. We were not uh, trying to <laughs> overthrow the regime. We were trying to consolidate the regime. But let's leave that for another day. Um, there was another NGO uh, that we considered kind of our rival, an, an American-sponsored NGO, who were trying to do the exact opposite. They were trying to educate citizens for how to deal with our techniques. These were new techniques back then of like, uh, you know, mailing and things like that. You know, these, these ancient ways of, of elect, uh, elect and ad, now I think about advertising, uh, media advertising, that was all brand new in Russia in 1992. Their job was, you know, under this large rubric of civic education to empower citizens to know how to discriminate against these tools of persuasion. Uh, what would be the analogy to that today? Uh, and what, how could we empower citizens to be better able to deal with uh, the, the 21st century uh, techniques of persuasion, manipulation, education, propaganda, depending on, I'm, I'm being, I want to be neutral as to what the action verb there is, but how would we change the balance of power focusing on individuals? Um, fourth, I only got five, just to warn you. Um, as a social scientist, when I listen to these conversations, uh, I get really nervous about this, this selection on a very narrow part of the information world that we all live in. And I know we we're assigned to do that, and you know, Rob Reich told us we had to do that. Uh, so I got that, uh, right? Uh, um, but but uh, Nate, I have you especially in mind, but uh, for everybody to comment on that, you know, if you were trying to really understand the effect of the Internet Research Agency or deep fakes, uh, of course, as a good social scientist, you wouldn't just select uh, that one source of information. You would, would, you would try to look at everything that influences how voters behave, right? Um, including uh, uh, old-fashioned traditional media, including uh, networks, including political parties. I mean, we have a rich literature, Nate, that you know well that has tried to look at this. And most certainly, you know, maybe they're just Neanderthals, but, but some people believe that those other things matter in terms of persuasion. Uh, maybe they're, they're just, they don't understand. But, but, but help us under, I'm, I'm just interested in like a research design of how we would isolate the causal independent impact, to use language from my discipline, of things like deep fakes or bots or non-bots when it seems like it's a pretty complex world out there. And I'm, I'm one, interested just because of it's a, it's a really important social science problem. Two, I'm interested because it's very, interest, it's very important if you're trying to isolate what external actors are doing, right? And we had this debate about 2016 where people said, yeah, there's all this stuff that the Russians did, but it didn't matter. Well, how would we measure to make sure we knew whether it mattered or not? And the other thing, uh, you know, prompted by Andy's comment, if we're going to measure liability from deep fakes, we have to have some way to measure liability, right, uh, against the, the backdrop of everything else that is out there. So 
you know, if you had a billion dollar, not, not a billion, if you had $10 no, million. No, no, I'd like a billion dollars. Okay, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, HAI said, Nate, we got we to understand the real world and the digital world all together. How would you even conceptualize a problem? And then the last question. Uh, in our report, to advertise one last time, and physical copies are over there, digital are easy to find on our FSI website. Um, we have uh, over 45 recommendations for how to enhance the security of American elections, right? Uh, here's, here's my twofold question to whoever wants to take it. One, imagine that the, the, I have an imaginary world and then the real world. The imaginary world is your best friend is the President of the United States. Your brother, sister, is, runs the U.S. Congress. Uh, and uh, now I'm, I'm, this is too, I don't, now I'm getting into, I don't, I'm, I'm making assumptions about your relationship with your relatives. Let's just, let's just say people that are really, really close to you are the president, run the Congress, and run the, the platform companies. What is the big idea in any one, all three of them or any one of them, that you would want them to do tomorrow, right? And now, and then that, so that's the abstract world. The real world, I just want, you know, we had 45, the clock is ticking. Uh, obviously, most of these things cannot be done today, given the, the time. What's, what's a real world intervention that you think could practically be done that would have a tangible positive impact on making our uh, electoral uh, ecosystem infrastructure better before 2020? So Andy, we'll start with you sure. and just go back to um, Yeah, I'll, I'll take a few of them. And um, so on the question of who's responsible and, and, and who pays, I, I think the answer is sort of you know, D, all the above, right? I, th I think there, there are you know, multiple actors with responsibilities of various types, and uh, including us as citizens, right? Now, you know, defining like, you know, what those responsibilities are and you know, sort of who pays when things go south is a challenging um, exercise, uh, but uh, you know, to me, this, 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 you know, trying to pin this on any one uh, actor seems to me to be uh, the wrong, the wrong approach to, to trying to, to get at this problem. Because I don't think, that, I don't, I don't think we can solve. There's no silver bullet, right, uh, for, for solving. I think that the, the t taking it and breaking it down into smaller pieces and targeting um, actions and behaviors you know, at each at each stage uh, is, is is what. Is most likely to so let me ask a more practical question. Why couldn't Podesta <laughs> sue? Uh, I think it was on a Gmail account. Why couldn't he sue them? Yeah, so his uh, property was yeah. stolen. Like why? Well, you know, I know it, mean, it takes a village and all that, but at yeah, a certain so, point, we got to like, like why? Why? Where's yeah, the liability? So, so um, liability is a funny thing. I, my, my first year here, I, I, I taught um, a course on on uh, cyber issues at, at at the law school. And, you know, so there's, there's law students, it's elective, so they're like second and third year class students. And I, I put up the Apple Terms of Service that you can just find on your iPhone. I'm going to pick on Apple. I, I, I use Apple. I love Apple, but I'm going to pick on them. Um, you know, you can, you can find the license agreement. And essentially, you know, like the, 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 the way that we treat um, software as a matter of law is that it is a, a good, not a service. And that means that, these, that vendors can disclaim warranties. Right, which, can, which means, in essence, they can say, you accept this product as is, and that means that we, the vendor, have virtually no um, exposure to liability if, if things go wrong, even if what went wrong was a bug in the system. Uh, there, there is a, a growing debate about, about whether this, this system, which, by the way, has served our innovation ecosystem very well, the software industry as we know it today, would not exist if you know, if, if software were treated <clears throat> as a service, right? Uh, um, but that, that is a, a question that's debated, and I, I actually think that, um, I'll make a, uh, just, you know, I guess Yogi, Yogi Berra said, you know, the trouble with uh, making predictions is they're about the future, but I'll make a prediction. I, I think that when it comes to liability issues in IoT, that we will see a big shift in the liability landscape, uh, you know, over the next decade, because I don't think that once, once safety issues come into play, we're not just talking about, you know, theft of, of, of personal information, then I think, I think the, the, there will be a, a backlash. Um, let me uh, take one more. So on, um, yeah, so the, the, the sort of the balance of power between the platforms. Um, let, me, let me give you a little bit of, uh, so I, I spent, you know, before I came here two and a half years ago, you know, was in Washington for 14 years. Uh, and what, what I observe is, is, you know, you essentially have this, you know, we see this tech lash, right, in DC against big tech companies. It's, it's interesting to ask, like, what, what was the situation before, before the tech lash? I mean, what, what was the, and I would describe it as this. 
On the right, you had a sort of traditional conservative, anti-regulatory, anti-interventionist philosophy that, that you know, essentially you know, uh, prevented them from taking an interest in these power questions. The more interesting set of issues is on the left, where I, I would describe it as, you know, on the left, for the most part, there are exceptions, but I would say this is, I think, the zeitgeist from probably 2000 and, you know, certainly 2008 until um, 2016, this, these twin presumptions of competence and good faith on the part of big tech. Um, the sense that, that A, um, you know, these big technology companies, you know, they were good for democracy, they, you know, they um, would enable people in <coughs> underserved communities to get access to resources in the wider world that, would, that they couldn't have gotten. All, all this, you know, so that, in other words, that their, their interests were aligned with a set of values. The other thing is I think that there was this, this presumption that they, these were extraordinarily competent people. That, you know, and, and, and by the way, the companies put a lot of investment in, in Washington, D.C. Into, into cultivating both of these. I mean, I was on the receiving end of much of that lobbying, like, in, into these, um, into this. And, and so, you know, they say, look, we're, we've got the best workforce in the world. We're, we've got brilliant people. We're, we're, we're changing the world. Come 2016, and uh, that, that, that collapsed on the left for, for, for uh, when it comes to good faith, I think, um, particularly the response in the aftermath of, of the election by Facebook. I mean, it's hard to overstate the impact that had on, on particularly on the Democratic side in, in, in D.C., on, on this presumption of good faith. And then when it came to competence, the fact that, that the company didn't know what was happening on its network, despite all of the messaging about their <coughs> technological prowess, about the power of big data analytics, is this, this, this lobbying and influence uh, campaign that, that the companies ran in D.C., totally called that into question. And I think you ended up with both of those sentiments collapsing on the left, and I think, um, and then on the right, obviously, we, a lot of the, the, the issues on the right have to do with this perception that, that you know, the platforms are biased uh, towards conservative viewpoints, that, you know, that, that Silicon Valley companies reflect progressive values and all that kind of stuff. Long story short, this, this, this consensus is collapsed, this kind of accidental consensus is collapsed. I don't think we know yet what that's gonna look like. Um, why don't I stop there and, and let uh, Renee jump in. So I think I'm the only one who's not a lawyer, right? So I, I have a... I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I wanted so to I'm be a lawyer, gonna, but I never right, made same. it. There's still time. <laughs> so I'll just avoid... We'll, we'll take uh, your tuition. Anything okay. All right. <laughs> avoid anything related to, uh, to liability and, and legality. But um, there's an the interesting question of... Uh, I think two of these are related, which is why doesn't Facebook ban political ads? And then what is the balance of power between government companies and people as we think about a lot of these issues? Um, if you recall, after the after the immediate aftermath of the 2016 election, um, in which you know, Zuckerberg's unfortunate statement that you know, fake news couldn't have had an impact, um, as the, that was in 2016. Mid-2017 was when we began to talk about Russia and the extent to which that operation had had an impact. Um, the original conversation was really very much more around fake news. I had done work previously on uh, actually conspiracy theories and, and prevalence of conspiracy theories on, on social platforms. Then I worked on uh, counterterrorism efforts and, uh, and ISIS content. And there was always a you know free expression was the uh, the thing that everybody kind of hid behind. Actually, this this absolutist idea of free expression. And one of the reasons for it was, in many ways, it was an abdication of responsibility. And the, the kind of constant conversation that we have right now is, who has the right to decide? So the platforms will tell you, you don't want us making the decision. And then at the same time, ironically, we hear, you don't want the government making the decision. Uh, and then there is no regulatory agency that exists to make the decision. And so we operate in a space in which the capabilities and the responsibilities are not adequately doled out. Nothing is really made clear. And we operate in this, um, gosh, who is to know, who is to say, uh, kind of paralysis that we've actually been operating in since 2015 with, uh, with the ISIS uh, issue, where I think the line I got once was, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, and if we take down ISIS content, like goodness, what a slippery slope that is. Um, so in the, the first kind of real regulatory move that we saw in 2017 was actually the Honest Ads Act. And when the Honest Ads Act was announced, there was immediate preemption by the platforms because oftentimes the credible threat of regulation will lead to, um, to an action taken to, uh, to kind of preempt that regulatory liability that would come from the actual passing of the legislation. And so what you saw Facebook create was the, um, the, the first pass was that you had to be verified to run um, issue ads. And that was where I went and got myself verified. A little postcard comes to your house. You go, you type in the number on the postcard, and you register yourself. You upload a copy of your, 
uh, your ID and that's how you become qualified to run issue ads. I actually did that because I had run an advocacy campaign uh, myself, uh, kind of a pro-vaccination thing, so I've actually managed a Facebook page and run issue ads myself. And my feeling with the why not to ban political ads is that as this uh, preemption of Honest Ads Act was coming about, Political ads, there, there was a recognition that was in fact entirely accurate that it's not just ads run by a politician or run by right. a PAC, but there's the idea of the issue ad. So for me, I ran pro-vaccination uh, ads um, and, and that I had to go get verified because vaccination was a hot button political issue and in order to continue to run the advocacy campaigns I had been running for years, um, that was why I was, uh, you know, made to made to verify. So there's this interesting question of like, who makes the decision? Right. The platforms are actually able to execute on a decision fast. So Honest Ads Act has not actually been passed, and we're in 2019. Uh, but some of the core provisions they did work to kind of jump ahead of those. So there's this uh, interesting dynamic around how we. Um, inspire companies to make decisions. I think on the balance of power front, though, just to kind of address that, there's the governments, the companies, and the people. Um, the companies, when we just talk about technological impact of AI, they are, in fact, the first line of defense. And what I was trying to allude to in my kind of like scary litany of all the things, um, you know, the impending doom, uh, is that as the as the advances in technology are made, the regulatory response will be substantially slower than what they can do directly. And so there is this, I think, opportunity for self-regulation. Sometimes it's gonna be prompt by, prompted by the credible threat of regulation, but the combination of self-regulation and then where what we are in fact completely lacking is, is the government oversight piece. When we think about the role of citizens, we actually in some ways again get back down to the who has the moral authority and who is going to execute. And so, this is, I think, one of the, the core problems of the lack of trust and the fragmentation and the absolute inability to come to consensus in this country right now uh, is that there are very few entities that we can point to where there is such a, a significant enough degree of trust and a recognition of authority that they, that, that will be seen as a, an apolitical, genuinely for the public good uh, advocacy campaign. So we're seeing things like... Um, is it AARP, the retiree, uh, the, the retiree um, magazine? My, my parents get it. They'll send out actually these articles about how not to get tricked on the internet and things like that. So you're seeing these smaller demographically uh, targeted organizations that do enjoy a, de a degree of trust um, undertaking it from a civil society perspective. All right, let me give a, a minute on each one of these. The first is, well, why not ban political ads? Uh, Renee already touched on this, which is what is a political ad? That, that is a, no matter what Facebook does, they're still going to have to be in the business of distinguishing between what is political and what's not. That's increasingly difficult in our society when everything is becoming political. So the Nike Colin Kaepernick ad, right, will be will fall into this bucket. Well, are they going to call that political or not? The Gillette ad dealing with uh, sort of had a Me right. Too theme to it. What do they do with, deal with that? That's not to say, look, they're going to have hard choices no matter what they do. They could potentially ban candidate ads um, and party ads, ones that, that mention um, uh, candidates. You know, most of the Russian ads that were discovered, right, were not specific to candidates or parties, and so you don't get, it, it depends which problem you're trying to solve, right? Now, um, also Zuckerberg, you know, explicitly <coughs> said this last week, that, you know, that it's not as if if you ban political ads on Facebook, you somehow sanitized the information environment so that then malicious actors or, or overly persuasive actors are not gonna have a role in this. This gets to your third point right. also, yeah. which is like, you know, what, I mean, why not ban political ads generally, right, on TV? I mean, is it a different argument to say that there shouldn't be political advertising on Facebook than there would be on television or something else? You could regulate it if you want to deal with, say, disclosure and micro-targeting. We might think those are the particularly pernicious aspects of Internet uh, advertising. I got a lot to say on that, and we'd say a lot of it in, in this report. But, um, you know, people don't like advertising. People don't like like political money and they don't like politicians, so therefore political advertising is kind of the perfect storm, right? And so that's gonna be true. Uh, people don't like 30 second ads on TV. They don't like <coughs> it on Facebook. Um, Zuckerberg makes the argument that look, you know, Facebook ads are cheaper. If you are an, a challenger in a race, you are better able to communicate through Facebook, particularly outside the United States, but certainly within the United States, as compared to if you were to um, buy a television ad. Right. Frankly, I think they, 
they should just get out from a company standpoint, they should get out of the business just because right. like it's more headache than it's worth at this point. Like if they, if they just said, all right, you know, we're not going to take candidate ads, um, you know, it's worth it. Uh, because, th and I know that there's sort of in the back of your mind, people think, oh, well, look, they're making so much money off of these political ads. Frankly, the bottom line for them is insignificant when it comes to the total ad revenue that they've got and the compliance costs and all this other stuff is really marginal. I do think there, there are other motivations that, th that are not necessarily pure that are, that are part of this. Uh, it's really not about the financial impact. I can talk ad nauseum about political advertising. This is actually how I got into this field. Uh, if you're interested, I, I wrote a piece well before the 2016 election uh, called um, uh, The Campaign Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Uh, the second um, point about uh, deep fakes, spear phishing, loss of trust and like. So my view on deep fakes, right, is that the, right, the harm with deep fakes is not the individual deep fakes that you'll be duped into believing something which is not true. It's that, as Andy said, that there'll be a loss in trust in media in general, right? Which is that it's the cumulative impact of the fact that someone, like the Malaysian example that I think Renee mentioned before, that we will be, that, that politicians and others will have the greater ability to say that didn't happen because you know things that are in front of your lying eyes are not actually uh, uh, likely to be true because we've seen deep fakes have become prevalent. That is, totally exogenous to any detection regime that we have right. in place, right? The prevalence of deep fakes um, and, and, and the more that this becomes part of our, our lived experience, it doesn't make a difference if they're, if they're often going to be detected. Um, um, it's just going to be whether the, uh, the signal that is being sent by the speaker or the politician and the like is that, you know, that you should not believe this. And so then it gets trapped into all of our other sort of agents of polarization right. in the media environment. So who do you trust, right? And then you turn to elites that you trust as to whether um, you should believe this or not. And that's true with shallow fakes or not even, not even shallow fakes, something like Obama's birth certificate, right? Which is like, that's, that's no, there's no depth to that fake, right? Uh, where that you still have 40% of Americans or something like that, 30% uh, um, <coughs> who, who believe that he was not a citizen. It didn't require that you have a, a sophisticated artificial video for that. And there's plenty of other example, examples like that. Third, uh, and I sort of rectify the balance between citizens, platforms, and government. Um, let me talk a little bit about digital literacy here. We have a project here, Sam Weinberg, um, uh, in the education department on digital literacy. He's affiliated <coughs> also with uh, Project Democracy on the Internet at the Cyber Center. Um, and I, you know, I'm all for this. You know, who could be against digital literacy? And, and uh, who could be against teaching people critical thinking generally, right? Uh, but if it was easy to do, we would have done it a long time ago, right? And it's extremely difficult to think about how you can have a broad-based you know, inoculation strategy for the the mass public. I'm giving a talk at the Naval, um, uh, what, what's the Monterey Naval Postgraduate uh, school. Post school on on Thursday on this, right? And the military folks are always talking about talking about this in kind of medical terms, right? Inoculation and 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 um, you know, sort of these types of measures. But it's like the the problematic content is what is coming out of the mouths of politicians, right? And it's like you cannot disentangle the um, you know, the, the average piece of content that's just coming from a Russian source from something that's from the domestic <coughs> political environment, right? It's basic, sometimes it's, it's literally the exact same thing, it's just right. being amplified by a different actor, right? And so if you're talking about whatever this problematic content is, um, that, that's politics right now, right? And so it's extremely difficult to figure out how to get at you know, through some kind of widespread education program um, uh, to teach people, hey, you should ignore this thing but not that thing, even though they look very similar, right? Now, there are, there are things I think the platforms can do and that they are doing, thinking about kind of micro digital literacy as opposed to kind of macro digital literacy on how to use the products, what it means if something's in your newsfeed, how you can, you know, turn the dials on, on uh, certain aspects of the information that you're receiving, how, do you, how you can know why you're being targeted through ads and all that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot, a lot of work that can be done there. The fourth point you were making about, well, how, do we, how should we disentangle the effect of uh, new media from, uh, say, legacy or, or, or non-digital media on the information environment or on election results? And to some extent, that's an impossible problem to solve. Uh, if Facebook turned over all their data to me, I could take a crack at it, though, which is to say, you know, if you, if you could match up with the voter file um, um, the types of communication that Facebook users were, were 
confronting, say, in the 2000 election. You could try to figure out whether, you know, for example, if RT was advertised, you know, if this, this group of people was more likely to receive RT uh, or other kinds of Russian content, do you see aberrant levels of, say, Trump support in those areas, right? That's the kind of study that you would do. It's extremely difficult, though, to disentangle, as you said, um, uh, you know, new media or, or internet influencers or mal malicious influences, whether they're deep fakes or others, from everything else that's happening in the media ecosystem. And one of the problems now is it's, it's very hard to figure out where kind of internet influences right. end and legacy right. media influences begin. So, you know, just takes, take like a very <laughs> common phenomenon, right? Something starts on, on, on 4chan or 8chan, maybe it makes its way into uh, some kind of fringe uh, website. Then it gets picked up by Breitbart. It gets to the top of the Drudge Report. It finds its way uh, onto um, you know FoxNews.com. The president then tweets it, right? And then CNN runs a a, a uh, you know a total you know news feature on it, right? So is that the legacy media that's doing the work there? Is that the internet, right? There's a person at CNN who is paid full time to watch the president's Twitter feed. Right. Okay. So, so that is the that is the, um, in some sense, the new media, right? But it's 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 all sort of interwoven. And in some ways, that's the that's where the um, the internet media the, or the digital influence campaigns have their greatest impact is when the legacy media picks them up. This is a tune that Alex Stamos, our our colleague, the Internet Observatory, plays all the time. He's like, look. You look at the 2016 election, a lot of the Russian influence campaign was successfully taken up by the New York Times and other kinds of uh, legacy intermediaries. Final point, which is what's my big idea for tomorrow? What can we you know, do to change the world? Um, I got a lot of them. Some of them are in here. Uh, uh, but, <laughs> Just take but, one. But, but, but they're related. Obviously, this is my hobby horse, which is that we need people outside the platforms to have access to the data that will be relevant in trying to develop uh, measures to combat these these problems, right? And and so we need to find a way through the privacy laws, through the different regimes that are preventing outside researchers from having these data. I would personally have the government compel Facebook and Google, whether the European governments or the U.S., compel them to have secure research environments where outside researchers can do monitoring. And th that would lead to a family of measures that I think are critical in this area which are early warning detection systems. This is something that, that I think Renee is, is really one of the nation's best people on. Uh, thinking about how you can develop AI uh, to, to, uh, to, based on things that have happened before to try to detect uh, problems that you're seeing in a, in a current campaign. Fantastic. So I have an apology. My questions took more time than I thought. Uh, that's on me. Uh, but they were great answers. So I think it was a win-win for everybody. But let's, let's do this. We have... Uh, Andy, when do you actually have to go? A quarter till. Okay. So let's go to... We have 10 minutes. Let's aggregate questions. I think we have microphones somewhere. Uh, yeah. We're recording, right? So we need to have people speak yeah, into microphones. So we'll have one there, and we'll have one there. And I think we should just aggregate one round and then give everybody a shot uh, to answer them. Uh, so if you could just <coughs> come to the microphone for the purposes of recording and ask your question. And I'll take should four or go? five, and then we'll let our uh, panels, panelists respond. Identify Please, sir. Identify or not? Should we identify ourselves? Yeah. Sure. Or it's anonymous? Well, up, up to you. It's, uh, you know, it's free country. I don't know. What, what, <laughs> uh, what would Cato say? John Samples, Cato Institute. <laughs> Uh, great panel, very interesting. Uh, so I have two questions. One is, United States constitutionally has a elections or any other time has a laissez-faire policy between speakers and American audiences, right? One way the everything was said here could go is away from a laissez-faire policy. The, the verb disrupt was used uh, several times. So I have two questions. One is for Nate, which is, to what extent is public disruption of the relationship between an American audience and a foreign speaker permitted under the First uh -huh. Amendment? And would, do we actually perhaps need to change that policy down the line? And then for Renee, the question would be a question about Facebook. One of their uh, responses to this, to, to get at, not get into the content discrimination business, has been to demand uh, authenticity uh, with accounts. So fake accounts, that's just a disclosure policy, a mandatory disclosure policy. To what extent do you see that as effective? Sure. Um, hi, I have a question more in the um, responsibility um, 
distribution side of, of the conversation. So we talked about responsibility, um, and it seems like the responsibilities for putting off fires started by the deployment of these new technologies, including deep fakes, um, into the cyberspace. But when you ask yourself who creates these technologies, those are not Russians uh, or the Chinese. Those are very often American universities. Um, and the technologies used in deep fakes were developed in at the University of Montreal here. The <laughs> first, um, the, the paper that showed you can change uh, what Obama is saying <coughs> was published at the University of Washington. So my question is, when, on top of that, computer science and AI researchers, when asked about the potential misuses of the technology they create, often say, this is not our responsibility. We are just showing what's possible. Someone else will take care of it. What do you say to them? Great, great question. Please. Matt Chesson, Department of State. So I'd like to tease out this idea of anonymity online and, and whether this is actually at the core of the real problem because we've created an online environment that has anonymity with very little accountability and responsibility. If we had that type of environment in the real world where you went to a bank or a supermarket and half the people were in disguise, you would not feel safe. You would not have a trusted uh, environment around you. You couldn't have a functioning democracy. But we somehow tolerate that online. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that in the context of this idea, and I wrote about this in a paper called The MadCom Future, that you know, we're probably about three to five years away from having this torrent of AI-enabled machine-driven communication that could drown out all of the social spaces online and potentially threaten democratic speech online. Seeing that we're moving into that environment, how do we address this anonymity, accountability, responsibility issue now so that when we start moving into that environment, we're prepared for it? Tough, hard questions, uh, please. Oh, God. Uh, Bobby Johnson from MIT Technology Review. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, under American law, corporations have the right to speech. They have certain freedoms. Uh, they're allowed to you know, pay their way into politics as part of that free speech, and, and they have certain rights of personhood. Do you imagine a situation in which uh, AI-created mm -hmm. entities have the same rights of personhood that corporations have? Great question. Last question, yeah, Hi, please. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Colin Garvey. I'm a fellow here at the uh, HAI and over at uh, CSAC, the Center for International Security. Um, my question is um, kind of in the spirit of uh, the political scientist Robert Dahl, who said, I think uh, the, prob uh, the solution to a broken democracy is uh, more democracy. So I wondered um, if maybe an available uh, low, what your thoughts on a, a low-tech solution might be uh, to this problem <clears throat> in that could it not be that registering 100% uh, of American voters and uh, making sure they get to the polls maybe with incentives um, diverted from like a UBI plan or something could um, uh, reduce the need to say inoculate the population or build barriers around the electoral ecosystem in that um, with, for all their sophistication, these attacks seem to really only be successful in um, elections that are decided by a few percentage points either way. So if we brought participation up in elections to, uh, let's say, 100%, could that maybe not uh, be a cheaper solution to the problem? I'm going to suggest Andy go first because then yeah, let's, has to run out. How about uh, yeah. Andy, Nate, and then we'll give Renee the last word. Sure. Uh, those Mix are it all, up a little. Those are all great questions. Um, and... I, you know, I actually don't even know where to begin. Um, so I think uh, on, um, maybe on, on that last point, I mean, we, we actually, you know, we have some ideas on this in, in, our, in our report. Um, uh, you know, th there is a, I mean, Nate will, will know this better than me, but, you know, I, I, I mean, the, as I understand it, you know, and Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but Americans, I mean, not voting, you know, is, is a form of expression. And you know, I, I just I don't know if if you know if that would uh, if, if a, a compulsory voting system would would work here. I just I just uh, maybe Nate, you you know better than me. Got a lot to say on that. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, why, why don't I stop there? I'm, 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 I, I spoke more, so you guys go ahead. And but before you stop speaking, yeah. advertise your next panel at three o'clock. Oh yeah, so we the have the precise title and where it is. Yeah, so uh, it's just just up the street at um, Aralaga at the Alumni Center. It's on uh, China and uh, AI issues, um, and we have two really cool panels uh, covering a range of, 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 of AI-related issues concerning China. We're also uh, putting out a, uh, a, a collection of essays on a variety of, of, of China AI topics that draw heavily on original uh, Chinese language source materials. Great. Thanks, Andy. 
Nate? So I have to start with your question because you don't, you don't know this, but I was Bob Dahl's last student. And for, and, and for his class, I wrote a paper on compulsory voting. So, I mean, I don't know. That Maybe you did know that. Did you know that? Kind of mind out here. Um, and so, look, it depends what problem you're trying to solve. And that's true with all of these kind of institutional design questions. I mean, uh, Tomas Elvis, who's, who's here, President Elvis from Estonia, uh, talks about how, like, single member district elections and the Electoral College. Uh, exacerbates the sort of significance of a lot of these uh, influence operations because of the, the, the winner-take-all quality to this. So there, there is something to be said for that, but again, it depends whether, you know, for some of the stuff that Renee was talking about, it's not just about elections, right? It's about democratic deliberation and the health of a democracy writ large, and so we still got to deal with these problems even if uh, there are good reasons to uh, tinker with the electoral system. Um, let me go back to uh, 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 John Sample's question at the beginning, um, with what are, the, what are the legal rules on, can you get in the way of a domestic, sort of an American right to listen to a foreign speaker? Is that a, way, a good way of characterizing it? This is something, by the way, that we, we I have a chapter in this uh, that really relates to that. I have a, a great student uh, from last year, Zach Krowitz, who um, did a lot of research on that with respect to whether you could ban foreign broadcasters like RT and Sputnik, right, uh, from reaching American audiences, right? So, because what, what the Obama administration did, right, is force them to register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, right? And, and because of the actions that they had taken. But could you even ban them, right? Could you, could you do the same thing for, uh, what, C CTV, right? Could you, and then the question is, well, if you do it for them, could you do it for Al Jazeera? How about the BBC, right? Could you have the US wall itself off from, uh, foreign sources of information, and then the question is, well, not whether they have First Amendment rights to reach an American audience, but do America, does the American audience have a First Amendment right to hear them? Great questions. Interestingly, the, the, the most sophisticated jurist on this question is now on the Supreme Court, which is Brett Kavanaugh, who, is, who had to deal with this when he was um, in the uh, DC Circuit and, and weighed in on this question, and at least in the context of political advertising, where he, he talked about it, um, he said, look, you can ban foreigners from engaging in paid political advertising, and one of the reasons you can do that is because they still have the capacity to speak to American audiences, uh -huh. right? And so he kind of walked that tightrope. Um, I think that it'll be very interesting to see what, how that you know, comes out. I think the answer, you know, it, it's not clear to me which way, say, this court would come out on that. Um, but, you know, in the spirit of Citizens United and other kinds of cases, like you're familiar with Bilotti and these other ones, um, giving you your, your First Amendment class today, uh, there is a sense in which uh, the, at least the conservatives on the court are friendly to the argument that you have a right to listen, not just a right to speak. And so the, you have the right to um, acquire that kind of information. Um, but obviously th there have to be limits on that just like any other kind of uh, First Amendment right and so to what extent is banning say RT from uh, US airwaves or from the US internet comparable to you know preventing shouting in a fire in a crowded theater. Um, second, uh, uh, oh the question about responsibility for deep fakes, great question. I, I, it's funny because we had um, one of the, one of the um, progenitors of deepfakes here at Stanford came and gave a talk into, in the law school the other day. Uh, uh, and that was, boy, a hostile environment for him to walk into because uh, uh, they were basically making that kind of argument. He said, look, you know, one of the great things about, you know, deepfakes are just the, the next stage in our culture, in uh, culture of storytelling. It's like, okay, great, yeah, you know, and, and that's really important for, for culture. It's like, who's gonna be against storytelling, right? Okay, All right, and so, uh, uh, but on the other hand, so that's, that's on the benefit side of the scale. You know, end of democracy, end of trust between people is on the other side of the scale, right? It's like, well, so how do you, how do you weigh those things? Um, and so I, I think the best answer, right, as to why universities should be engaged in this, right, is because we're kind of the last line of defense, right? We should be the ones who are trying to develop the detection techniques. That's why we should be doing the research on deep fakes and artificial video is in order to prevent the malicious use of the technology. Um, but we have a responsibility. I, mean, I think that's probably a mantra that's been sung in many of these uh, panels at the HAI conference, which is like the ethical use of technology is what Stanford should be uh, really at the forefront of. Uh, the point about anonymity, I mean, you know, we're, uh, we're 
singing the same tune here also. I mean, I completely agree with you about what the risk is and, and what the danger looks like going forward. I think we're already there, like I said, that most speech which is occurring online is being done by, um, by computers. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with, with developing a regime that, that really uh, combats the anonymity problem. It is extremely difficult to think about how that would be enforced, right, um, uh, in an international sense, right? I mean, how would you, I, I think the platforms, you know, could be held to accountable, account on this and we could think about ways to regulate them to force um, uh, real name policies, right? Twitter and, and Facebook obviously have very different views on, on how that should go. But um, yes, I think this is one of the big, big questions that Thomas Silvis also has been uh, writing and thinking a lot about this on whether you could have more um, authentication right, in, in people's uh, use of computers. Um, Did so, you want to get in on this? You, you just raised your hand just for one. An AI question which you didn't touch at all. Oh. Can I, can I, let me just say, yeah, yeah. answer okay. that, last, that last point, which is um, uh, do, do, well, I'm going to rephrase it as do robots have First Amendment rights, right, which is if you think that um, corporations, which are non-natural persons, have the right to speak per Citizens United, do, uh, what about AI? And so I've got a student, uh, Stevie DeGroff, who used to work for Google and then was at the law school last year. We have a paper on this precise question. And, you know, the answer is, yeah, robots don't have uh, First Amendment rights, but there's a question as to whether... Um, whether the person who developed the AI has First Amendment rights that are basically being expressed through the AI. And so that, this gets into an area of First Amendment law where you start thinking about, well, regulation of AI, <coughs> is that a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction, particularly a manner restriction on speech? Um, we're going to be confronting that, those kinds of questions uh, you know, in the coming years. Um, and I think the way that the courts are going to be thinking about it, again, is thinking about AI as an extension of a person, not as to you know, the constitutional rights of robots per se. So, Renee, you get the last word, and we'll yeah, just, we'll and just talk among uh, ourselves. I see we're losing our audience, so I don't want to let yeah, Renee no, have sure to speak against the Yeah, I'm sure that you all get to the, the, uh, the China talk that I'm also supposed to go to. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the anonymity online question is, is that was actually going to be my answer to your, your fifth question, which is what is the conversation we need to have, or you know, what would you do tomorrow? I think the, our ideas about identity on the Internet, that's one of the next big questions that's going to come up. And this ties into the, um, the Cato gentleman, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name's uh, question, on... Um, to what, uh, to what extent are the authenticity measures uh, effective? And that's because one of the things I didn't go into is the whole taxonomy of different types of actors that engage in influence operations, but um, the one that I spend most of my time on is state actors. And I can tell you that they are not effective uh, for state actors. And that's because one of the things that we are beginning to see, something that we thought was going to happen as soon as the Honest Ads Act verification, um, sorry, not the, not the actual Honest Ads Act verification, but the response to it that I was alluding to, um, is the expectation that entities would be created for the purpose of laundering identity effectively. Uh, so people who are now serving as the entities that run ads or the entities that manage pages are in fact using their real names, but they're operating at the behest of a sophisticated state actor. And that is where the authenticity metric is challenging because they themselves are authentic. This does in fact allow them to evade uh, the authenticity piece, and it does push us into a realm where this is not a thing that social media platforms are necessarily able to detect unless they screw up by planning the operation on like Messenger or something like that. Um, and so this is the, uh, the interesting area where although I personally believe that we need to be discussing identity on the internet writ large because it's not just sophisticated state actors, there's also much more kind of lower rent entities that play in disinformation. Um, I think that people are going to increasingly want to operate in a space where there is a higher degree of trust in where the messages are coming from. I think otherwise you, you wind up in this framework. I don't know how many of you are very active on Twitter, um, but you will see people accusing other people of being bots constantly now. There is just a, a remarkable degree of distrust. Anybody who has a different opinion than me is a bot kind of uh, attitude. Um, and that is where I do wonder about how we think about that societally. Like, can we continue to function with that degree of distrust, not only in media, not only in institutions, but on a, on a very kind of person-to-person -person level? Um, so this is where there's the idea of uh, what should the Twitter blue check or Facebook blue check or whatever, uh, what should the connotation of, of a voluntary verification be in terms of uh, establishing trust as a credential in the marketplace of ideas? So I think you got a small taste 
because there are just a couple of them, of the terrific new team we have at the Cyber Policy Center. So I want to encourage you to engage with our website and sign up for other activities that they have. For old school people, we still have some of these left over there. Um, and the second thing I just want to do is uh, join me in thanking our terrific panel today.